Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Tree School Online. My name is Brian Gordon. I'm the Family Forest Land Coordinator with the Oregon Department of Forestry, and I'll be your host today. Uh, we have kind of a small uh, group of folks joining, uh, so maybe the setup will seem a little bit long and formal, but these are being recorded, and I want to make sure I cover all the uh, right details as we get started. So again, thanks for joining us. And Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. I want to give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading the project and to the Oregon Department of Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service for some grant funds that helped us make the webinar series possible. As a reminder, Tree School Online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. There are two webinars each Tuesday, one at 10 and the other at three. So this morning's webinar will be given by David Diaz and Sarah Loreno. Both are with EcoTrust and our topic is free online forestry planning. So we'll be looking at some great tools that have been developed by EcoTrust. Before I further introduce David and Sarah, I do wanna cover a few housekeeping details and go through some technical components uh, for Zoom, which is the platform that we're all using this morning for the webinar. Um, to start with, we'll talk a little bit about the toolbar and some of the features there. And that toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you can uh, scroll your mouse or your cursor down over that area and it should pop up. On some devices like iPads or phones, the toolbar may be at the top of the display. And this is where most of the features uh, for Zoom can be accessed. Uh, for this morning's webinar, both audio and video won't be available uh, for participants, but we will make use of the Q&A function for written questions. So if you have any questions this morning as we work uh, through the webinar, that's going to be your, your primary way of communicating with us through that Q&A box. I'll be monitoring it throughout the webinar and um, we'll be taking a, a number of breaks as we kind of move through uh, for you to, to ask questions and, and we'll try to get some answers up. There is also a chat feature and uh, we've got the chat set up uh, for you to use if you're having some technical problems. Um, today's co-host behind the scenes is Carrie Berger. She's going to be helping me out and she's going to be monitoring that chat box. Um, so if you have any uh, technical issues, post them in there and Carrie will do her best to help you out. Um, and again, please be sure to use the Q&A and not the chat for your questions. Um, resources can be found on the Tree School Online Class Guide page, which you can reach from knowyourforest.org. That's the website you may have gone to to sign up for today's webinar. If you click on the webinar uh, description, you'll be taken to the OSU Extension website where you can access class resources for each webinar. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, we had just had a conversation about this as we were getting things set up. There's nothing up there specifically for today's webinar, um, although I think we will try to get uh, a URL, a link in there uh, for you to access the online planning tool. I think David and Sarah will talk more about that. Again, a reminder that these webinars are being recorded and they'll be archived as YouTube videos and uh, those will be accessible from knowyourforest.org. We're also gonna use some polls during today's webinar. There um, will be one up front um, to uh, collect a little information about all of you so we, we know who we're working with today. And then we'll have a, kind of a wrap up evaluation poll near the end of the webinar. The polls should automatically pop up on your screen in a box. Um, and then after you answer the questions, the poll can be closed. If you don't see, see the polls, they don't pop up automatically. Um, check the Zoom toolbar and look to see if that poll uh, button is highlighted. And if it is, you should be able to select it and get that uh, poll to pop up. So this morning's webinar will follow a slightly different format from the others that we've done so far. Um, we're gonna give you the opportunity to follow along and try out some of the tools that David and Sarah are gonna be demonstrating today. So that means that we'll kind of be moving through the presentation in a stepwise fashion. Uh, we'll take some pauses along the way. And it's during those pauses that you'll have the opportunity to get into the planning tool, try out some of the things that David and Sarah are demonstrating and then use that Q&A function to ask questions that may come up um, as, you're, as you're working through uh, some of those steps. 
Um, in order to do this, that means you're going to have to be flipping back and forth, switching, switching back and forth between Zoom and your web browser. And so depending on your setup, uh, if you, particularly if you only have one screen uh, on your computer, um, you may need to minimize Zoom in order to see your webinar, uh, to see your web browser, um, and then you'll have to come back. So uh, once you have minimized Zoom, it will likely appear on your screen as a small box. Uh, you might just see a, a single video, uh, maybe of, of David or one of the, the speakers. Um, and if you hover your mouse over that box, you should see a small green arrow. And if you click on that, that will maximize Zoom, uh, bring it up full screen again. If you have trouble, again, you can use the chat feature and uh, Carrie will try to help you out. But also, if all else fails, uh, you can always leave the webinar and re-enter. Uh, you can do that as many times as you want and you'll just uh, pick right up uh, pretty much where you left off. So that's sort of your worst case uh, scenario. Last option is to quit and try again. Okay. So hopefully we've covered uh, all the housekeeping details and we'll go ahead and jump in then to the webinar today. Once again, today's presenters are David Diaz and Sarah Lorino. They're both from EcoTrust. David is EcoTrust's Director of Forestry Analytics and Technology. And according to the website, uh, that makes him their data nerd and ecosystem science translator. And Sarah is a natural resources data scientist with EcoTrust. Oregon translated by the website, she's a problem solver, modeler, map maker, and data explorer. So David and Sarah, thanks for joining us. And I'm going to let you guys go ahead and uh, jump in and, and further introduce yourselves uh, before we jump into the first poll. Great. Uh, uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, it's really good to be here with all of you. Uh, this is one of my first times giving a live hands-on uh, demo of Forest Planner, so I think we'll all be learning something together, um, but really excited to share uh, this free online uh, web application that we debuted at Tree School uh, several years ago. Um, so my name is David Diaz. I'm Director of Forestry Technology and Analytics at EcoTrust. Um, I've been with EcoTrust for about seven or eight years. Um, and most of the work that I do there is um, data and technology related. Uh, we do a lot of work, particularly working with family forest owners to try to provide better tools uh, uh, to make more informed management decisions. Um, and uh, my background and training is in forest modeling and computer science. Um, and uh, I have a, a master's degree in soil science from Oregon State, and I'm currently um, in a PhD program. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. So I'm in Seattle right now, um, and my colleague Sarah um, is uh, working from uh, Portland, uh, where EcoTrust is headquartered. Sarah, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Lorino, and uh, thanks, Ryan, for the intro. I am a natural resources data scientist at EcoTrust. Um, I've been with EcoTrust about, um, geez, three and a half years now, um, and uh, I love working uh, with with David on these kind of technical tasks. My my background is in GIS, and I do a lot of modeling and visualization. Um, so my role in this um, tutorial today is just kind of background, uh, helping out David with questions when they arise, and and keeping my eye on the question and answer box. So. Um, if you guys run into anything, feel free to use that, and we'll try to get your questions answered. Great. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with EcoTrust, I'll give you a quick background um, uh, about our organization. We're a nonprofit um, uh, headquartered in Portland, Oregon, although we work across what we call Salmon Nation, uh, so anywhere from Alaska into Northern California. Um, we have uh, programs uh, uh, related to the, what we call the life support systems of our region, so food and farms, fisheries, and forestry. Um, and uh, our forestry team is primarily oriented around this idea of enabling landowners and enabling markets that uh, recognize and encourage ecological forestry. 
Um, so when we talk through the application today, you know, there's nothing that, that's going to tell you what a good way or bad way to manage your forest is. You know, our general expectation is that your ethics and your conservation values uh, will lead you in the right direction. And, and so a lot of our kind of motivation here is just to provide uh, better tools and, and information for landowners to make decisions that we think will translate into a better world for all of us. Um, so before we dive in uh, uh, to the application, um, uh, we've got a, a first poll just to get to know you uh, a little bit more. Um, and so you should um, have a few questions that are popping up uh, here. And so go ahead and answer those and we'll dive right in once you're done. Yeah, so I've just launched that poll. And uh, as, as David said, these are some questions to just kind of help us get to know all of you. Um, so if you can start Hopefully you, you're all seeing that and you can start answering them. There we go, we got some answers coming in now. So the questions are about where you're from, um, a little bit about who you are, if you're a woodland owner or a natural resource professional. If you own uh, land, how many acres you, you own or manage? And then we have a couple of new questions that we've added just, or I guess one question we've added just for today's um, webinar. Um, which is asking about whether or not you all have a written woodland management or stewardship plan for your property. I think we've just about got everybody's responses. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and we'll share those results out. So hopefully everybody can see um, Pretty normal distribution here for us for, for Tree School Online. About three quarters of you are from the Limit Valley area. A uh, couple of folks from Washington, uh, one, one person joining us from the Oregon coast and a couple of other folks from states outside of Oregon or Washington. Um, a little over half of you are woodland owners um, and the rest of you are identifying yourself as either resource professionals or an other category. Um, it's like a pretty good split in terms of uh, land ownership around 30% uh, of you reporting between 10 and 40, 23%, 40 to 100, and it's like four folks are around 20% at, at 100 to 1,000 acres. Uh, so nine of you have plans that you've written yourself. Two of you have a plan that was um, completed by uh, a consultant, it looks like. And uh, the rest of you are uh, here to think about some, some management planning. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, close that out and I will get out of the way and let David and Sarah take it away. All right, it's really good to uh, see how many of you have already kind of gotten a pretty big head start on management planning for your property. Um, and so I think some of the, the functionality of this application that we're gonna work through today will be uh, hopefully uh, right in a sweet spot for you to start figuring out different ways that you could manage your forests um, and what might happen if you do that. Um, so before I dive in, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about Forest Planner. Um, it's a free and open source web application that we launched a little over five years ago um, at Clackamas Tree School. Um, we've done a workshop um, every year, uh, every year at Tree School since, um, and this has really been one of the highlights of my uh, highlights of my year is being able to share this with a lot of people. Um, so basically uh, uh, what we're going to go through here is a series of uh, demonstrations where I will show you how to use the web application. Um, the link to get there um, should be in the chat box, but it's, it's forestplanner.ecotrust.org. Uh, you can also just Google Forest Planner and it should, should usually be the first thing that shows up. Um, but so uh, the first thing I want to start with um, um, is just how to get in. Okay, so if you want to be able to come back uh, um, to Forest Planner, um, you need to create an account. Um, and so you can log in uh, and create your own username and password uh, for Forest Planner, or you can log in using, uh, using some existing accounts. So what you want to do first um, is click on this login button or get started. Either of them will take you to the right place. Um, and if you have a Google account, you can log in with that. Um, if you have a Facebook account, you can log in with that. Um, 
I'd strongly encourage you uh, when you're using the, the uh, Forest Planner tool to be using a web browser like Chrome or Firefox. Um, Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge may or may not work uh, smoothly um, because they have different rules about how they interact with web applications than most of these others. So uh, if you use one of those, you'll probably have the smoothest ride. Um, but so uh, I'm going to uh, log in with a, uh, a demonstration account uh, that I have here uh, to show you what that looks like. Um, and it will log you into the tool and um, should take you to, if you haven't created a property before, it won't take you to a property, um, but you should have a zoom out there. So let's, um, um, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can, uh, uh, you know, start asking them in the Q&A or in the comment now. Um, otherwise, um, go ahead and uh, let's pause there and uh, go ahead and fire up your, uh, um, uh, your web browser and see if you can log in and create an account with Forest Planner. So we got our first question there. Oh, you got it, David. Okay. Um, yes. So the I first question we got that. up is. The answer all, is all yes. This, all, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question is, uh, will you, um, whoops, it disappeared Oops. on me, but um, are, can, can you put more than um, one property into uh, Forest Planner? And so the answer is yes, you can. <laughs> Great. Um, so if anyone has any issues logging in, uh, you know, let us know. Um, otherwise, we can uh, uh, go on to the next step. OK, so let me hop back, hop back over here. So if this is your first time logging into Forest Planner, um, what you probably saw when you uh, landed to this page was essentially a big zoomed out photo uh, overlooking Oregon and Washington. Um, so uh, what we're going to walk through over the course of these little breakout sessions are essentially numbered here on the top of the of the application. So you can also use these to navigate um, if you want to jump forward or backward um, uh, as you're using the tool. But essentially, the the main workflow that we're going to progress through is finding and mapping your property, um, dividing it into management units, saying what type of forest you have in each one of those management units, and then this choose your own adventure piece where you get to say what happens if I do this, what happens if I do that. Um, so by the end of uh, uh, today's webinar, hopefully you will have uh, uh, worked through each one of these steps, at least with a single stand on your property um, and start to get a sense of the potential for using an application like this to try to chart your own path to forest stewardship. Um, so to give you a sense of what that would look like to find and map your property, you can uh, look for uh, look for a place using this uh, um, search bar. It works just kind of like Google Maps. So you can type in uh, place names or addresses. Um, when you look at this map, we have a couple. Uh, you can navigate inside the map using the zoom in and zoom out buttons up here, um, or this kind of three lines indicate the map layers that you can use uh, to turn off or on. Um, so you can change the base layer, um, uh, or you can actually do something like looking for tax lots. Um, so if your county has published uh, tax lots um, and made them accessible, um, we, should, we should have them displayed here. So for example, you can um, zoom in and see the tax lots for a particular area. Um, and what you want to do is click on this uh, green button that says draw a new property. And what will happen then is that uh, you'll have a little animation here that shows you what to do and some text explaining how to do it. But basically, you'll have a little dot following around your mouse pointer. So uh, go ahead and every time you click, uh, it will put down a corner um, of the property that you're drawing. So go ahead and when you're done, double click to finish and then give your property a name. Okay, so now it should have mapped your property um, and will tell you some basic information about it. Uh, if you made a mistake um, and want to refine it, uh, you can click edit and each one of these corners that you put down can be moved. 
Um, so you can uh, dial this in as much as you want. You'll see these faint dots in between the, the ones that you put down. You can grab one of those uh, and move them as well and it will add a new corner uh, to the property. If you want to delete one, you can just hover over it and hit the delete key on your keyboard um, and then uh, save your changes and it will drop you back uh, uh, to this main, main view here. So let's go ahead and uh, give that a shot on your property. Um, and if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into Q&A or the chat box. And so David, in terms of that question that we had earlier about creating a new property or having multiple properties in here, you've demonstrated that here on the screen then, right? You, That's exactly you had right. that God's Valley property in there and then you just clicked on draw a new property and it populated a different one. That's exactly right. Um, and so what you'll want to do is uh, I would encourage you to, uh, if you have multiple different parcels um, or, or properties that you own, um, I'd encourage you to, to draw each one that's, that's um, not contiguous as its own property. So even if you have two or three parcels that are very close together, but they're not actually adjoining, um, I, I would encourage you to make a separate uh, a forest planner property for each one of those tax lots. Um, and uh, you'll be able to evaluate uh, scenarios for each one of them independently. I'm not seeing any questions popping up in Q&A. Hopefully folks are navigating the technology well. So, and I don't, hopefully I'm not skipping ahead on you. I'm just, I'll, I'll just ask a question myself. I noticed that I see on the screen here, the option of uploading GIS data. Is that something that you're going to talk about later? Or? Uh, I, I wasn't planning on it, but I definitely can. So if uh, most of the people that we interact with uh, often don't have GIS data or don't know how to create it. Um, but what GIS data is, the GIS is short for geographic information systems. Um, and so if you've had a management plan prepared by a forester, for example, they may have uh, walked the property, drawn drawn your stands, uh, uh, and mapped them out digitally. Um, it may have given you a CD or you know digital files that you could load into a geographic information system that would display uh, where those stands are. So if you have data like that, um, it needs to be formatted in a particular way. So if you did click this button, it would tell you you need to zip up. The, what's called a shape file. So there's a variety of file components that are associated with that. Um, uh, it needs to have a particular map projection uh, for it, um, but otherwise you could just choose that file, give it a name and upload it, um, and it would map the property for you. Um, now what it's expecting is a shape file that is your stands. So it will determine your property boundary based on the outer boundary of all the stands that have been drawn, but it, it would allow you to skip essentially steps one and two uh, if you have that already done and jump straight to defining forest types. Okay. Um, so definitely chime in, chime in if anyone is having issues there. I think, you know, one of the main things that we'll want to, to get through here is that there will be plenty of opportunity for you to come back and fine tune and tighten up um, uh, any of the scenarios or, or maps that you've drawn uh, here. Um, so as we're going through, uh, you know, don't worry about getting a lot of the details right and perfectly mapping the, the property boundaries and things like that. Um, uh, we can tighten that up later um, and are happy to help, uh, happy to help uh, with you to do that. Um, I see a question coming up uh, uh, about editing the initial property boundary and moving a line um, uh, that the incorrect line, the old incorrect line did not disappear. Uh, so sometimes we've noticed that if you edit things in the in the forest planner, uh, one of the ways that you can uh, get it to refresh or update is just using the uh, uh, the refresh button on your web browser. So for me, I'm using Chrome. Um, it's up here, this little curly button um, in the top left. So usually, if you hit refresh, it will essentially reload the web page, um, and a lot of those things should get fixed. Great question. Um, so once we've drawn our property boundary, uh, um, uh, the next thing that we're going to do is, is to divide the property into management units. Um, so you can click this blue button and the interface will be very similar. Um, uh, so we, we can click draw a new stand um, and it's going to give us a, a dot that will follow us around and we can uh, uh, map out individual stands. 
Uh, we have some additional map layers that might be handy for this. Um, so for example, we can show you where the streams uh, and stream buffers are, if there are any wetlands on your property, um, where some of the steep slopes are. Um, so these are areas where if, if the slope is greater than 30 or 40 percent and you wanted to do any harvesting, you'd need to use different equipment um, uh, than you would be able to use on, on uh, uh, flatter slopes. Um, so you have a variety of different layers here that you can explore to turn off and on. Um, uh, but these are some of the good ones that will give you a pretty good indication when I, uh, uh, of where different uh, forest types are on your property. So I usually do this using the aerial image. You know, you can zoom in like this and you can grab the map um, and move it like this. Uh, but I'll usually zoom in and use the aerial image uh, like this. Um, and uh, it will snap. Uh, if you're moving your mouse around, it will snap to your property boundary. So you don't end up with a whole bunch of slivers and things like that when you're drawing a new new uh, stands. Um, but so you can just start clicking on the map. And so I'm going to uh, do this area here, which looks like a, a relatively young plantation and double click to finish. Um, you can add as many stands as you want as you're going through this uh, uh, kind of first trial. I'd encourage you to just start with one um, so that we can get a sense you know, of how to go through the entire pipeline. Um, but you have the ability here to save stands and add another um, but for now, I'm just going to save stand and finish. And it will tell you some information about that. Um, uh, in the background, it's gonna go and query some geographic information uh, about the property. So for example, if I hit refresh, uh, it should hopefully, oh, it looks like it can't find the aspect of the slope uh, right now. Um, but normally what will happen is that you'll see for each stand that you draw, you can get some information about the, the area of the stand, which direction it's facing, uh, what the average slope is and what the elevation is. Um, so go ahead and give that a shot. Um, and then we'll come back um, and talk about uh, making forest types. Oh, one thing I'll add here um, uh, is that if you have uh, places on your property that are not forest, um, do not map them out as stands. Um, so the, the forest planner is going to expect that every every forest uh, every stand or management unit that you draw is going to have um, species and size of trees uh, that get defined for it. Um, so if you have an area like this, which is a field or a home site or something like that, do not uh, do not draw a stand around them. Leave them blank, um, and they will essentially be left out from when you do scenario planning. Um, for forest management applications. So David, while we're waiting for folks to try that out and maybe ask some questions, um, what some guidance you might provide in terms of how you would delineate your stands? What are some things folks might be thinking about? It's a really good, really good question. Um, so. Typically, uh, uh, when you're thinking about drawing different forest stands on your property, it's areas that have either a different forest composition uh, right now. So they could be different species or different sizes or, or management histories of trees. But it's essentially ways that are going to be convenient for you to manage the forest or, or to do different conservation practices. Um, so the types of things that people will usually consider is, like I said, use, using the aerial imagery, you can usually see, for example, that this area up here on the top left corner of the property has a different, uh, looks different than this area uh, just outside of it. Um, so depending on how detailed you want to be, you might be a lumper or a splitter in terms of dividing your property into different management units. Um, but you usually want to think about the structure of the forest, the composition of the forest, whether or not there's any different management objectives that you would have for different areas on the property. Um, and then also whether or not there are any constraints. Um, so that's where, like I said, the slope, you know, is, is a good indicator um, that you might uh, have to use different type of equipment. It might be more expensive, for example, to do harvesting on steep slopes. Um, but you might also want to look at forest practice regulations, you know, around streams and wetlands and things like that, where um, you will have more constraints on what you'll be able to do on the ground. So uh, it's not uncommon for people to draw riparian areas, for example, as a distinct management unit, um, because you're, you uh, have to follow different rules in, in stream side areas than you do on the rest of your property. Right. You're making it too easy. I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. 
Well, if anybody uh, starts to feel like I'm moving too fast, please chime in. That alone will be a helpful, um, uh, helpful feedback as well. Uh, so we have one question uh, here that's asking, I have a four acre field that has almost no trees. I'm thinking of adding trees. Should I map it as a stand or not? Uh, well, thank you for planting trees on your property. Uh, first, um, you can map that as a stand. Um, and I will talk about how to add that as a forest type um, in the next section. Essentially what you will be doing is you'll say the trees that are there, um, the trees that are there are the ones that I'm going to plant. So you would say I'm planting 250 Douglas fir trees and 100 Western hemlock trees or whatever, you know, whatever species you're actually going to be planting. You'd say I'm planting a bunch of these and they're very small, um, you know, one inch diameter trees uh, or smaller. So we have a question. I can't get my boundary. Um, it will not start. Um, so uh, if you are defining your stand, you first want to click that uh, draw, draw a stand, um, draw a new stand, and hopefully that will give you something to follow you around. Um, uh, this will only work if you've already uh, created a property boundary uh, as well. So if you're jumping in late, you might just want to follow along um, uh, with the demonstrations, then we can work with you uh, offline uh, to do more troubleshooting. Um, so uh, I have a question to go over the differences between um, stands and forest types. Um, so uh, you can think of a stand as a particular instance uh, that may correspond with a forest type. So for example, you might have a 35 year old Douglas forest, uh, Douglas fir forest that occurs across your property. On one side of the road, you might make that one stand and on the other side of the road, you might make it another stand because you're gonna manage them uh, differently. Um, so basically, the the stand is a is a management unit. You know, it's an area that that you're going to manage consistently, um, and uh, uh, you might monitor or do inventory work in it um, independently of other areas. Um, so the forest type is something that might be the same across stands, um, but oftentimes they are they, they are. Uh, oftentimes the forest type will be a very good indication of whether or not if you've changed forest type, you're probably in a different stand. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, and uh, we have a question about doing plot assessment. Um, uh, so if you're creating a forest management plan and you want to do some uh, stand exams or things like that, uh, Forest Planner does not currently guide you through how to do any uh, field exam uh, or inventory work. Uh, there's a really good application called Plot Hound um, uh, that you can look into do, to do that. We've done some workshops on that before. Um, and I think there's other workshops actually as part of tree school uh, that can also help you figure out how to do uh, different types of field measurements uh, uh, and what, what you might want to do, what level of rigor you might want to do for doing uh, forest inventory um, as you get into your forest management plan. Uh, but, but so forest planner kind of assumes that you have some basic information about the forest types uh, on your property. Um, so that you will be able to type them in uh, what type of species and sizes of trees you have. Um, so if you don't have that, um, you can just make something up for now. Um, uh, but the next next stage we're going to jump into here um, is uh, um, uh, creating forest types. Uh, so once you have a stand mapped out, um, you can go to define forest types uh, for your property. Um, and uh, most of you should have this uh, show up here that says you have not defined any forest types, you can add one now. So if you click this green button, it will uh, give you this new window where you can create a forest type. So uh, based on the area that I mapped out, I'd say this is probably a young Douglas fir plantation. Um, I'd say maybe it's 12 years old. And what you're gonna be filling out down here is what a forester would call a stand table. Um, so it's going to ask you for different species. You can uh, use this uh, um, to scroll through and select different species, or you can also type in and it will filter filter for you. Um, so I'll say I've got Douglas fir trees in here. So you're going to specify the species, a size class, and how many trees per acre you have. Um, so uh, with this forest, I'd probably say I've got some two to six inch Douglas firs and that I might have uh, 250 of them per acre. I'll say there's probably some Western hemlock that's in there as well. Um, 
it might have a, a come in on its own. So it might be smaller and I'll say maybe there's, uh, you know, 75 uh, trees per acre there. Um, so you can add as many species as you want um, and size classes as you want. Um, this is typically part of something that um, you can get from inventory if you've had an inventory done, um, but you can mix and match, you know, different different uh, species and sizes. So for example, I can also say there's a few Douglas fir that were uh, uh, large trees that were left from um, uh, the previous the previous uh, uh, forest prior to harvest um, that are still there, um, but there's just a couple of them that are left. Um, so once you're done with that, you can scroll down and click save forest type. And what will happen here is for every forest type you create, uh, they will show up as different colors uh, over here on the left. So you'll essentially have like a painter's palette um, that you can use. Um, and again, you can go back in and edit, you know, if you want to add or, or uh, remove uh, um, trees from that stand table. Um, and then what you can do is you click on the, the, the stand on your property and say, that's where I've got that type of forest. Um, so this is a good example of how uh, the earlier question about what's the distinction between stands and forest types. Um, so this is an area where you can say, I have this forest type and you could select multiple stands across the property and say, this forest type occurs in all of those stands. So you don't have to create a separate tree list for every single stand. So um, now it's your turn, uh, your turn to try this out on your property. So give it a give it a go and see if you can create a forest type. So we do have a couple of questions coming in there. Um, first one is asking about density. If you don't if you don't have that information, um, how to you know how to proceed. Yeah, so uh, right now, just guess. Um, so th th there are some, uh, um, you know, typically, um, you know, as you get to larger trees, you're going to have fewer per acre. Um, but normally what you're going to be looking at for most uh, trees that are above a few inches um, is that you're going to have somewhere between a couple hundred to maybe a thousand if you have a really you know, large number of trees in there. That's usually something that we only see when there's, you know, lodgepole pine or western hemlock or something like that. So I'd say if you put some number in that's in the, you know, uh, low hundreds, uh, you'll be you'll be in a safe place to start. Um, but that's the kind of information that you could get by actually walking out in the woods and estimating what's the average distance between your trees, uh, for example. So you could convert, you know, if my trees on average are 10 feet apart, um, how many trees per acre um, uh, does that translate into, you can find some little calculators if you Google for that, uh, that will show you how to do that math um, uh, to help get some of that information. And um, that's also the kind of thing that a forester, whether that's from extension or a stewardship forester, anyone who's coming out on your property should be able to help you get some ballpark estimates by walking in the forest with you, even if you don't end up doing detailed uh, inventory work. Um, so uh, we have another question is, what year is the aerial view from? Um, so this is coming from a service called Mapbox. Um, so most of these uh, aerial images are a mosaic. Uh, so um, if you zoom across different parts of the landscape, you may actually see, you know, different aerial images that are stitched together. Um, so they don't generally tell you exactly what year each aerial image is, although they're usually updated on a rolling basis. Um, so typically these types of images are updated within two to three years. Um, depending on uh, which data source you're using, but Mapbox is usually, like I said, updated within two or three years. Um, so you may not see very recent activity. You know, if there's been a harvest or something like that on your property or neighboring properties, it may or may not show up for a couple years because um, um, it takes a little while for these things to filter through and get updated in these web services that we pull from uh, to, show, to show on our application. So David, the question too, I had noticed when you were creating that stand, uh, it looked like the drop down menu is pre populated with a lot of native species there. And I uh, just wanted to confirm, I thought I saw them, that you have both softwoods and hardwoods in there. So you, you could have different, a, a pretty that's, good blend of tree species. That's right. So we could come in here, for example, and say, oh, there's also some red alder, right? Um, and say, I've got 15 of them. Um, so you can mix and match, you know, different species and sizes. We've got a very big variety uh, of species in here, although, you know, it's not, it's not exhaustive, 
Uh, so there will be some um, uh, trees uh, that you might have on your property that we don't have uh, uh, in the list here. Um, so if that's the case, you know, uh, I'd try to pick a tree that has a similar form. Um, so it's like a similar size, you know, has, has a similar shape crown, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, um, use that as a substitute. Because um, basically what's going on behind the scenes here is um, uh, we're matching the forest type that, that I've typed in uh, to a big database of forest stands that we've already simulated. Um, so by the time we get to evaluate future scenarios, we're not actually doing any growth and yield modeling on the fly. Uh, what we've done is we've said, find a forest stand that looks like this one, that's on a similar slope, on a similar aspect, has similar sized species and trees, um, and show me what happens when it's managed this way or that way. Um, so it allows us to give you very quick results uh, when you get to management scenarios, but there's this kind of matching process, you know, that's going on under the hood. Uh, of this application. So you might see some errors uh, when you're typing in uh, this, particularly if you have very large trees, you know, of rare species and things like that, that we weren't able to find a match uh, for you. Um, so if you uh, run into trouble like that, where um, there are error messages that pop up that say, you know, no, no stand specified or no forest type specified, that's probably what's going on is that we're unable to find a, a decent match in the database that we've uh, used for simulating different management options. And we do have plenty of time to, or just time check for you, David, that we're in great shape. Yeah. So yeah, I, that, that reminds me when I gave the intro uh, to this, I didn't really kind of describe the original motivation for why we got into Forest Planner in the first place. So um, basically, like I said, what's going on under the hood here is that there is a growth and yield model uh, that we've already run. Um, to do a lot of this choose your own adventure kind of stuff. So before we got into this, basically, I was doing a lot of work with individual landowners where they would come and say, hey, you know, a, a lot of it initially was around carbon markets. Uh, landowners were saying, hey, should I, should I do a carbon project? Is it worth my time? Um, you know, could I make any money off of that? And so for each landowner, we would go through this process of, well, what inventory do you have? Do we need to collect new inventory? Can we get it into a format that we can then use a growth and yield model on? And so for each landowner, it would take several months at least, you know, to go from that first interacting um, to say, I'm interested in learning more about what I could do with my property. It's actually generating any information. So the basic idea of Forest Planner was to try to put a lot of that uh, of power into your hands directly so that you could start to do growth and yield modeling uh, without having to be an expert modeler or to know how to use GIS uh, systems and things like that. Um, so that trade-off means that we've kind of hidden a lot of the complexity of how different growth and yield uh, models work um, and uh, but allows you to kind of get to this stage where you're comparing different management scenarios much more quickly um, and we'll kind of show show uh, uh, when we get to the scenarios kind of what some of those different comparisons are um, that you could actually do uh, uh, between your property and different management options. Everybody having a good time mapping out uh, mapping out a forest type. It sounds like that's great. Um, so the next thing that we're going to get to once you've kind of defined a forest type um, is to get into evaluating management scenarios. Um, so um, once you've done uh, assigned, uh, you need to have a um, you need to have a forest type assigned to every stand in order to proceed into management scenarios. Um, and so you, you should have this kind of bar, it's like a progress bar up here that will tell you how many stands you have and have not applied uh, forest types to. So once that's completely green, uh, you should be good to go uh, to the next uh, scenarios for your property. Okay, so the first time you show up here, um, there should be, um, a grow only scenario. So this is the only thing that we can say, you know, uh, without doing anything, this is what would happen to your property if you left it alone. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, every other management scenario that you're going to create is going to be uh, through this, clicking this green button and saying what you want to do and where. 
Um, so we're going to hold off until the next uh, uh, breakout session to kind of talk through all the different maps and charts um, that you can use to compare. Um, so for now, I'm just going to show you how you would create your first management scenario. Um, in addition to grow only, which shows up here. Um, the other thing, you know, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that I was clicking and hitting refresh on things. So if you have any any uh, little red um, red buttons that show up and, and say, you know, uh, this this scenario is out of date, you know, or data has changed, click refresh. You can either click this refresh button or you can also click the refresh button on your browser. And either of those should uh, uh, try to update things and hopefully will resolve. Um, some of the some of the bugs uh, uh, that may have come up. So uh, to get started, um, uh, to create a management scenario, um, we've got a couple steps that we're going to walk through. So the first is just going to be visualizing whether or not there might be any constraints. Um, and uh, so these are things that might be regulatory or they might be voluntary uh, restrictions. So for example, if there's conservation easements um, that are in a, a public database, we will show them. Um, but we can also look at areas where we have streams and wetlands. Um, we are displaying the uh, minimum uh, riparian buffers uh, based on um, ODF uh, um, forest practice rules. Um, so uh, these will change depending on the type of stream, whether it's fish bearing or non fish bearing, whether it's used as a water source uh, for drinking. Um, and uh, the size of the stream as well. So you can see that the buffers here, you know, are larger around this uh, uh, this part of the of the stream and smaller on some of these uh, uh, feeder um, uh, feeder channels into the stream. Um, so uh, one of the things that that uh, I'd highlight here is that um, these uh, stream buffers are based on. Uh, ODF, uh, an ODF stream layer and the ODF stream typing. Um, so a lot of this has been done from modeling, you know, not every single one of these streams has actually been visited, you know, and so uh, uh, in my experience, um, uh, you will often see streams that the map thinks exist that don't actually exist. It tends to be, uh, it tends to over predict where there are streams on the property. Um, so you could use your better judgment here, you know, we're not, we don't actually prevent you from uh, simulating whatever type of management you want to do on any part of your property. So we're not um, enforcing uh, regulations uh, uh, across your property based on these layers, but they can help you get a sense of if you want to do a particular management in this area, you probably need to think about constraints that are gonna be related to operating in a stream, uh, stream buffer or around a wetland. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, nothing's going to be a substitute for talking to a forester and talking to a stewardship forester uh, about forest practices compliance. Um, so definitely don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, run a scenario here and then go out and do some logging without actually talking to any professionals. Um, that's still an indispensable part of doing responsible management on your property. Um, but this can uh, uh, help you kind of provide a sandbox, essentially, where you can game out different scenarios. Um, uh, before you uh, talk to a forester or even as you're talking with a forester to say what are the trade-offs of doing this type of management or that type of management. Okay, so we can turn on the layers like this um, and the next step is going to be uh, choosing what type of silvicultural prescriptions we want to apply. Um, and uh, so the first time you show up, um, grow only is going to be an option uh, here. Any other management options uh, or silvicultural prescriptions um, uh, are uh, going to be uh, uh, shown by clicking add new prescription here. So uh, one of the things I, I wanted to show you here was that uh, for some of the more technical uh, uh, phrasing, for example, prescription uh, or silvicultural prescription, you'll often see these little information uh, uh, buttons like that. If you hover over them, uh, they should give you a little explanation um, that can show you uh, uh, what that means. Um, and so um, to create a new management uh, management prescription here, we're going to click this add new prescription button. And essentially what it's going to do is it's going to give us a series of questions that are going to help us identify a particular management approach. So I'll say I'll want to do a 60 year rotation. Do I want to do commercial or uh, pre-commercial or commercial thinning in my 60 year rotation? Um, I'll say no. Um, I just want to do the final harvest uh, every 60 years. I'll leave my forest alone in between the time it was planted and when it's 60 years old. And what type of species uh, uh, do I want to plant 
when I harvest. Um, so I can do a Douglas fir and Western hemlock uh, mix, or I can do mixed species, which will include other uh, true firs and things like that as well. Um, so a lot of this is related to what region you're in, uh, which species you can choose from. Um, so if you're closer to the coast, we'll usually have this Douglas fir and Western hemlock mix, uh, primarily related to um, uh, the occurrence of pests that attack Douglas fir plantations. Um, but if you were on the east side uh, of Oregon, for example, you would have different options here uh, for what uh, what type of species you could plant. So, uh, you know, the application is aware of uh, which location uh, around Oregon and Washington uh, you're in and uh, will change the type of management options that you have and the type of species um, that you can use based on where you are. Uh, so I'll say I'll plant Douglas fir and Western hemlock, and then you can give this a name. So I'll call this 60 year rotation, Doug fir, Western hemlock, no thinning. Okay, so now just like forest types, I've got a couple options here um, that I can choose from. Uh, so uh, you can create essentially like your, your toolkit of silvicultural prescriptions that you want to choose from. And then you can select the areas on the map that you want to apply them to and hit apply. Um, if you want to change them at any point, you can click on it and then apply a different management prescription, for example. Um, and uh, like most of the other things, you could go back in and edit that, that prescription if you wanted to. So I'm going to uh, uh, leave this as my 60 year rotation now. Um, and so if you have more than one stand on your property, um, you will be mixing and matching. Uh, 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 assigning different silvicultural prescriptions to different stands. So each prescription is essentially a, a, a plan for what you want to do in a single management unit. And a, what we're calling a scenario is the mixture of prescriptions across your entire property. Um, so for example, if I had another stand over here, um, I could apply grow only to it. And the combination of doing a 60 year rotation here and doing grow only over there would be this new scenario that I've created. Okay, um, so once you've applied uh, your um, prescriptions to all of the stands that you want to manage, you can go on to the next step. Uh, one of the things uh, that you will notice is if you have areas where you have not assigned a management prescription, uh, you will have something up here uh, that'll say, what, you know, how many stands have management prescriptions specified? If you had stands where you did not specify uh, a management prescriptions, it will say that stand will default to grow only. So if you haven't said, I'm going to manage this area in a particular way, the application will assume you're going to leave it alone um, and allow it to grow undisturbed. Um, so just be aware that if you haven't, if you haven't explicitly said, I'm going to do this type of management here, um, that that's what will be going on behind the scenes. Um, so now you can give this a helpful scenario name um, and a description so I remember what this scenario does. Um, so this would be something, for example, you know, 60 year rotation um, in young plantation. And then you'll save your scenario. Okay, um, so it's going to, when you click save, it's going to dump you back to this landing page here where you get to see your different management scenarios. Um, this is essentially the, the librarian running back into the database now saying, I'm looking up your property. Um, so it's saying it's in the task you check back and hit refresh. So again, you can hit refresh here um, or you could hit refresh up here. And uh, uh, hopefully it has found a matching uh, um, uh, management uh, scenario for a forest type like yours um, and can now display it for you. Okay. Um, so you can see, for example, that we have uh, uh, now, you know, a 60 year uh, uh, rotation um, that's happening here that we can start to compare and contrast with the grow only scenario. I'm going to hold off on diving into comparing different management scenarios. Um, and so now we can break and uh, each of you can try to create a management scenario and assign it to one of your stands. There are a couple of questions up there and I think um, the first one kind of relates back looking back a little bit further when we were talking about defining stand boundaries and mm -hmm. uh, this individual has a 23 acre property and 
was just curious about sort of the minimum size, you know, what, what's a sort of a good general size for those um, stands from a management perspective? That, that's a question that I know we get a lot in management planning. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, there's definitely some landowners that are lumpers and some that are splitters. Um, so, uh, for example, I've interacted with landowners that have actually gone out with graph paper and mapped out the location of every single tree on their property. Um, I think that's uh, for most people, that's a lot more detail than you'll ever need um, and a lot more work. Um, so typically what we see uh, uh, with folks that have uh, more than 10 acres um, is that uh, you'll, you'll typically have stands or clumps of trees that you might map out that are at least two to three acres in size. Uh, you know, a lot of it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, so for example, if you have projects that you want to do where you're going to be um, planting some new trees, uh, for example, but you're only going to be planting two to three acres, you might want to draw that out as a, as a stand. Um, if you're planning a commercial harvest, however, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be able to get loggers to come out there to harvest one acre. Okay. Um, you know, it, it happens, you know, um, but oftentimes there's kind of like a, uh, a viability uh, a threshold where if you want to be able to do a commercial harvest that small, you might need to band together with your neighbors or something like that and actually get up to something closer to 10 to 20 acres um, before uh, you've got a scale that's actually really uh, relevant for commercial forest management. So, you know, anywhere in between there, you know, it's really kind of determined based on what your uh, management goals and objectives are, what the existing forest conditions are, um, and, and kind of how you, you want to interact with those. Um, so it's really kind of a, uh, there's a Goldilocks zone in there, you know, where it's, uh, uh, you can really find a sweet spot that's, it's coarse enough that the stands are big enough that you could actually manage them. Uh, effectively uh, without worrying about individual trees, um, but uh, uh, not so big that you've kind of washed out the important differences about the forest types uh, or things like that. So, you know, if you have a property boundary, um, you, you know, like if you have two adjacent tax lots um, and your forest type goes over the property boundary, it's up to you whether or not you would want to call that a, a, a stand break. You know, some people will, um, but if there's no difference in forest types, you know, as you cross that property boundary, you know, the forest isn't, doesn't know that there's a property boundary there. So in terms of how you manage it, you know, you could just as well uh, keep that as a, as a single management unit. Um, so my plan is to grow an old growth forest. Do you have a plan for native diverse old growth forest? It's a great question. Um, so. Uh, there's a couple different options uh, you could use to grow an old growth forest here. Um, so one of them is you could do nothing, right? So this is your grow only scenario that's pre-populated for you by default. Um, the other option that you could have uh, is a couple of the management prescriptions, um, like I said, that are different for each region. Um, if you want to still be doing active management, we have a repeated thinning option. Um, so this is where you're never going to come in and cut down all or most of the trees. Essentially what will happen is every 20 or 30 years, um, I, I think we might even have a 10 year option, uh, you'll come in and you'll essentially just do some thinning uh, work where you take out a proportion of the trees um, and leave the rest. And so what that, what that will do is that will create a different type of forest structure over time that will allow trees to get bigger um, and more diverse uh, over time uh, um, as you do that type of management. So those are the two main options that you have uh, for this. Um, and we have a question on like screen three a technical, uh, yeah. about the forest types. Uh, you've applied forest types to five of five stands. So someone was uh, has mapped out five different forest stands. Um, and it says uh, forest type is unknown for one or more stands. Assign or wait and refresh. Uh, how can I fix this? So this is an example where I said that the, the librarian who went back into the database to try to find a matching forest type uh, for one of the ones that you've typed in was unable to do so. Um, so uh, I don't know that there's an easy way to identify which specific forest type it is. Um, but so one of the ways I would play with that is to assign a different forest type to one of your stands um, and see if that fixes the problem. And then you'll know that it was that forest type that was the one that, that was breaking uh, this lookup process. Um, uh, but because uh, it does seem like you've applied forest types to all of the stands. Um, so the issue is uh, whether or not there's a match being found. So hopefully that uh, will help help fix your problem. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to switch over uh, to our other property now. So you can see what, uh, if you spend a few hours, you know, or a few days even uh, doing this type of work, what you would be able to, to accomplish. Um, so uh, this is a, uh, to give you some context, um, this is a family forest property called God's Valley. Um, it's along the Oregon coast range um, in uh, Clatsop County. Um, this area uh, has, been, has a forest management plan that was prepared by a professional forester. Um, so they went out and did inventory. You can see that this place is actively managed. You know, we've got a harvest area up here um, and some uh, riparian areas that have been mapped out very precisely um, uh, around the riparian buffers prescribed by Oregon Forest Practices, uh, for example. And here's a good, good example of where the forester on the ground said the stream ends here. Um, so you can see that they did this mapping uh, of the forest stands and said the stream actually ends here. So this is where the buffer needs to be, even though the map thinks there's still a stream that goes all the way up like that. So, um, uh, but so these are all stands that have been mapped out by a forester. Um, and uh, here's a good example, you know, like I was saying of the type of information that should usually show up uh, for each one of your stands uh, when you click on it. So this is the type of information that if you're filling out a management plan, um, you know, when you're dividing the property into management units, you will often want to know, you know, what the area of each stand is and what the forest type is for it. Um, so you can copy and paste information like this from Forest Planner into your management plan template. Um, there's not currently a way to just export everything, uh, um, but, uh, you know, as we get to the end of the presentation, uh, we'll tell you a, a little bit about some of the work we're doing to make that easier. Um, but so we've got a, a much more elaborate uh, forest for stand delineation um, um, that's been done across this property uh, than, than the uh, demonstration one that I gave. Um, we also have uh, cruise data that was collected um, uh, maybe five years ago uh, uh, for this property. Um, so there's very detailed uh, inventory that was collected for each of these and the names are uh, maybe counterintuitive for you as a landowner. So this is something that, you know, the forester called this stand P7, I'll call this forest type P7 or P6 um, or type seven. Um, so you can give these names however you want, um, but they will have uh, very detailed, you know, uh, stand lists uh, or stand tables that were based on inventory data uh, that were collected there. So we've assigned all the different forest types to each one of these uh, uh, stands and we can jump into these management scenarios now. Uh, to compare them. Um, so we've created a handful of different uh, management scenarios that we can compare here. Um, and I'm going to talk you through uh, what you can compare using these graphs and maps uh, on the right. Um, so first, like I said, we have this grow only management scenario here. Uh, we've also created a longer rotation scenario. So I can show you what that looks like, uh, for example, in here. Um, We've got some 60 and 75 year rotations. Uh, so you can see we've applied some of these 60 year rotations uh, up on the top uh, top of the slope uh, up here. And then as we approach the stream, uh, for example, we've left these big grow only uh, buffers around the streams that are wider than the um, forest practice buffer uh, minimums. Um, and then we've got some areas that are kind of on these slopes uh, coming down to the stream from these uh, uplands. Um, where we've said we're going to do a 75 year rotation with pre-commercial thinning and commercial thinning and mixed species. So we've created several different management scenarios uh, like that, that we can mix and match. Um, and so now uh, where the real power of Forest Planner comes in is for you to be able to do these kind of side by side comparisons uh, of different management scenarios. Um, so you can turn um, different management scenarios off and on uh, by clicking these uh, check boxes over here on the left. Um, you can hover uh, over any of the plots um, and see at any given time um, what's the property property level uh, total. Uh, so right now we're looking at a timber volume uh, um, and board foot volume. Um, you can choose other uh, other metrics as well, and um, you also have the ability to turn. Uh, you can turn scenarios off and on here in the graph uh, by clicking on the legend. Um, and it will toggle those different management scenarios off and on as well. Um, so we have a bunch of different metrics that you can look at, okay? Um, so these will often cover the kind of basic, uh, basic things that a forester would want to know. 
um, particularly if you're doing any type of commercial harvesting or things like that. Um, you'll want to know what the timber volume is. We give it in both in terms of board foot um, and in cubic volume. Um, and uh, we can compare what the yield is. So, so given these different management scenarios, uh, how much would you harvest each period? Um, how much would you harvest over time? Um, so here we can compare these different uh, different management scenarios and see that that our 40 year rotations, for example, is going to be producing the most timber over time. Um, these other scenarios where we're doing longer rotations and what we call salmon safe riparian are leaving bigger no touch buffers around the stream. So there's less forest that's being actively managed for timber. Um, and so you can see we we still generate timber over time, but it's coming at a different schedule um, and we're producing less total. Um, so this is hopefully a really good way for you start to, to start to see some trade offs um, of how different management scenarios will compare over time. Um, so apart from timber metrics as well, you know, I heard someone talk about growing an old growth forest. Um, we can also look at things like how much carbon uh, your forest is storing uh, as well. Um, so here's an example where we can look at uh, under different management scenarios, how much carbon is being stored in live trees. Um, so this is really commonly what's being tracked if you ultimately wanted to pursue something like carbon offset certification uh, or through any incentive programs that might be offered um, through state or federal agencies. Um, this is usually what will be tracked um, is how much carbon is being stored in live trees. Um, and so what we do here is we can compare how much carbon is being stored in live trees over time under your different management scenarios. And it's kind of benchmarked against a regional average. Um, and so this will show you, for example, you know, our 40 year rotations fluctuate right around uh, what the regional average is. So it's a pretty good indication that business as usual is business as usual. You know, what you see happening commonly across a forest in Western Oregon um, is reflected by this kind of 40 year rotation for, for Douglas fir and Western hemlock forests. Um, as you adopt these lighter touch management systems, you end up storing more carbon over time. Um, but like we showed, there's a trade off, uh, obviously, that's going to happen in terms of how much timber you're harvesting um, as well that you might want to think about. And usually what we see is this scenario where if you walk away from the forest um, and, and leave it unmanaged, that is typically the scenario where the forest will store the most carbon uh, compared to other options. Um, so for landowners that want to uh, uh, do a lot of work to try to help mitigate climate change and things like that, there's usually kind of a sliding scale between intensive uh, commercial forest management and doing nothing uh, where you can find a sweet spot where you're adding carbon to the forest, um, leaving it for future generations, whether or not it will be harvested. Um, and and that, that's one of the things that we commonly see landowners doing. And here you, you can get an indicator for it. Uh, with a tool like this. So we can also look at how, uh, not just what's in live trees, but also um, looking at downed wood, uh, looking at standing dead trees, uh, things like that. Um, and so this will tell you uh, how much carbon is stored in all of those pools across the property. Um, if you want more information about uh, how we do these calculations and things like that. We have this documentation uh, link up here and that will give you all the gory details about what's going on under the hood, uh, about how we do calculations around timber and carbon and things like that. Um, how what we're showing here is not the same thing as a carbon offset credit. Um, so if you do want to do that, there's definitely more work that you would need to go through. Um, but this can start to get you comfortable with how different management scenarios produce different outputs uh, over time. Uh, we also have some indicators here um, that will show you how many acres do you have of high fire hazard, uh, for example. So this is based on how many trees and how tightly packed together they are. Um, uh, this indicator that we're using is essentially related to how fast would the wind have to blow before it's going to cause a crown fire. Okay, um, so it's kind of an index uh, of fire hazard. Um, and you can see whether or not different management scenarios are going to change the, the fire hazard for your property. Um, okay, so each one of these, each one of these uh, uh, graphs is showing you the property level, level total, uh, you know, for cubic volume or something like that across your entire property. Um, we also have the ability to do these side by side maps. Um, so, uh, you can choose the metric that you care about. So I'll just uh, look at age, uh, for example, and you can choose different management scenarios side by side. Um, and then you can kind of do this time travel thing. 
Um, so you can uh, start to flash forward in time and uh, it will show you how each stand is going to change for that indicator over the next 100 years. Okay, if you want to hide the legend, you can hide it like this, uh, clicking these bars. Um, and you can also zoom in and out of the maps if you want like that. Um, but we can switch, you know, between um, uh, different different metrics like that and, uh, um, and different management scenarios and have them update accordingly. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions as I'm going through this, you know, feel free uh, to jump in. Um, we have a question um, that I'm seeing now, is size type the diameter? Um, so uh, I'm guessing this is related to how you define the uh, size class of, uh, of your forest type. Uh, yes, that is referring to the diameter at breast height. Um, uh, so that's, uh, uh, you know, what a forester is going to measure is usually going to be consistently, you know, at, at the same height above the ground. Um, and they're going to measure the diameter of the trees there. And uh, we've kind of put them in these the diameter ranges. Um, so we've got like small tree, large tree, seedling, sapling, etc. cetera. Um, so that is referring to the diameter of the trees. Okay. Um, so we've got these side-by-side -side maps that you can do that now start to allow you to see what's happening at the individual uh, stand level. Um, and compare different management scenarios side by side. We don't have graphs that do that. So the graphs um, are just at the property scale and the maps show you the entire property, but allow you to see how each different stand is performing. Uh, so we don't currently have the ability to, uh, or we don't have it implemented, have charts that will show you each individual stand and how it changes over time. Um, but so for example, one of the nice things we can look at is, you know, if you leave your forest alone over time, you can see how, um, starting from now going into the future you can actually watch how carbon accumulates over time you know you could also do the same thing it'd be very similar to what the standing board foot volume is um uh, the board foot volume and the cubic volume will accumulate in a similar way to carbon um but you could also look at for example how much timber have i harvested from any stand uh, over time uh, either on a on a each time year uh, or each, each time period um, we're, we're flash forwarding here in five year increments um, or you could look at cumulative. Um, so we can do those kind of side by sides of different metrics. Um, uh, most of these are related to the um, forest stocking and forest structure uh, and things like that. Uh, if you want any kind of economic uh, considerations, uh, we have some charts um, that do some of the some of the costs and revenue. So this is not exhaustive. Um, so we do try to account for our best guess about given the forest type that you say you have and the type of management scenario that you'd like to implement, uh, how much money would you spend on harvesting? So ground-based harvesting is where you have a relatively flat slope. Cable harvesting would be where you have a steep slope and you need to use special equipment to actually get logs off of a steep slope. Um, and how much money are you going to spend actually putting logs on a truck and driving them to the nearest mill? Um, so most of the time you'll typically see that the harvesting expenses are usually the biggest. Um, um, and again, you can kind of turn those off and on. You can uh, 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 hover over the graph to see about how much money uh, it's going to cost uh, to do this uh, to do this work. And you can change different management scenarios uh, here to see how the profile of costs changes over time. Um, so this is the cost side of the equation. Um, there are some important costs that we don't have factored in here. So for example, we don't know the quality of roads on your property. Road maintenance or installing new roads or culverts may be a very big expense. Um, and we can't tell you know, whether or not your roads are in good condition, whether you have roads, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's a big, uh, a big caveat. You know, we're quantifying what we can quantify uh, based on similar forest types, uh, um, but there are some major unknowns um, uh, on the cost side that we haven't uh, uh, factored in here that would be a real part of actually implementing any harvesting. Uh, we have another question. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on how fire hazard is calculated? Um, if you go into the documentation, I think this is a good place for you to find that. Um, it should give you the citation for the method that's actually used for how you calculate this uh, fire hazard index. Um, 
and uh, it is related to the number of trees and the size of trees, but also whether or not there's essentially ladder fuels. You know, so if you have a lot of small trees um, that can carry a fire up into the crown, it will produce a higher fire hazard rating, um, etc. Okay, so we've got the cost side of the equation here. We can also do the revenue side of the equation. Now we haven't put those on the same graph, right? So we haven't told you what's your profit going to be, and that's because. Um, we, we intend this to kind of give you a ballpark idea. Uh, like I said, there's some important costs and revenues that may not be factored in here. Um, so we want to make sure that you, before you actually try to do any uh, decisions about management uh, on your property, this can help to give you a ballpark of how the different uh, revenue and cost sides of the equation might look, um, but actually coming up with a confident estimate of whether or not you're gonna profit from a timber sale uh, is definitely something you should talk to a professional forester about. Okay, um, so so generally, what I would say here is, although we report you know dollars all the way to the you know one million five hundred fifty five thousand one hundred and eighty seven dollars, you know I wouldn't hang my hat uh, on that being exactly right. Um, so, like I said, this is intended to kind of give you a sandbox where you can say, oh well, it looks like this particular management scenario produces revenue in flushes like this. You know, a more active management scenario. Uh, where I'm doing rotations every 40 years is going to give me revenue coming in more frequently, but it's going to be smaller each time than if I do something like long rotations where I end up having a, a $2 million, you know, a timber sale, for example, or, or gross revenue. Uh, so this can start to give you a sense of how money would come in and relatively how it compare between different management scenarios. Um, but uh, in order to do these comparisons, you need to first create another scenario first, and then you should be able to do these kind of side by sides. Um, so with that, you know, I'll turn you loose and you can try this on your own property um, and uh, type in any questions uh, uh, that come up uh, in the Q&A or chat. Um, and uh, uh, we, can, we can try to help you resolve any questions that come up. So David, I was uh, thinking back on that question about um, you know planning out uh, to the end goal of an old a forest with old growth characteristics, and thinking about the time series maps and some of the other models here, and just thinking to myself that you know that's really the value of this tool that you've got that you've developed is that it, it really demonstrates that there's sort of more than one way to get to a desired endpoint, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of constraints that you might consider along the way, and and so really to answer that question, you know, how do I get there? It, there, there, it depends on a lot, right? And so yeah. this tool lets you kind of play some of those scenarios out side by side and help make some of the decisions that you might make in your yeah. in your uh, management plan. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely intended to kind of give you uh, uh, enough of a, a sandbox to play in that you can start to figure out what the major trade-offs will be, what the primary outcomes and, and changes in your forest might be under different uh, uh, management approaches that you might consider. Like I said, there, you know, with the exception, if you're on the east side, you know, uh, there's no value judgments in any of the prescriptions or in any of the, uh, you know, which indicators you should be looking at or anything like that. The sole exception is that if you're in uh, eastern Oregon or Washington, we have an option in there uh, for high grading. Uh, so this is a, a was traditionally a common practice where the most valuable trees would be harvested and all of the unvaluable trees would be left on site. Um, so that is really discouraged, um, but is an example of if you want to compare what would have happened to your property if someone was being irresponsible, you have that option, okay? Um, so that's historically been very common, you know, across a lot of Eastern and, and Northeastern Oregon um, as well. So you can still game out scenarios like that. Um, uh, so we have a, a couple other questions that have popped up as well. Um, how often do you update maps? The property next to my property was logged three years ago, um, but the map shows uh, what it looked like prior to logging. So I'm guessing this is referring to the, the aerial imagery. Uh, so like I said, those get updated on a rolling basis by uh, the provider of the aerial image. So one of the things that you can do um, is that we do, uh, we do have a couple different um, couple different sources of imagery there. So for example, we have this hybrid uh, layer, um, which is showing you imagery from Mapbox. If you go on the map and you change to uh, this other button that says satellite imagery. Um, so you can see, for example, now we see some harvesting that showed up in this uh, layer that wasn't in the previous, in the, in the, in the earlier one. 
Um, so you can play around with that um, and it might give you a more recent um, uh, uh, image. Um, these are these are coming from Esri. Um, uh, so there's a couple different options that we have for this. Um, but uh, uh, those are the two main ones. If you want to see whether or not there's a more up-to-date image, that's the best that we can offer right now. Okay, um, there was one uh, other question. Can more than one person log in and work on properties at the same time? Uh, you can try it. Uh, um, th it may cause some issues. Um, uh, if you try to do it simultaneously, um, but there's no reason, for example, uh, that you can't uh, uh, work on it and then say, okay, now it's your turn, you go ahead and do it. So we definitely have families, for example, that use this where brothers and sisters um, or fathers and daughters are working on a property and developing management scenarios together. Um, more typically, the way that's done is that um, you would go in uh, to the account and say, hey, I've created this new management scenario. Um, you can go take a look at it now. So uh, uh, we, we, it might work, you know, but it's not really uh, um, uh, uh, pressure tested to see whether or not people at uh, changing things simultaneously will break. Um, and I'm sure that you could find out how to break it, you know, trying to do that. So um, the easiest way to kind of avoid any snags that might come up that way is to essentially take turns. Um, you can still be logged in at the same time um, uh, using the same account. Um, but basically, while someone else is working on it, you, you should have your hands off um, and wait for them to do it. And then you'd hit refresh if you want to see the changes they've made updated on your computer. Okay. Or you could use Zoom like we're using today. <laughs> or you could do a screen share. share. Exactly <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so uh, with that, I think we've kind of reached the end. I'm hopeful that, that uh, this has provided uh, uh, hopefully some good food for thought uh, for each of you. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there is a uh, uh, another web application uh, that we're working on right now. Sarah, I don't know if you have any slides or anything like that that you'd like to share. Uh, from it. Um, if so, go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm just offering a share. Um, but uh, uh, basically, we have uh, heard from a lot of landowners that are using Forest Planner. You know, traditionally, when we've done this, there, there are many folks that have come in and said, I'm trying to write a management plan. It seems like most of the folks that actually are participating today already have a plan, um, which is great. So this might actually be uh, in the sweet spot uh, for you. For a lot of landowners that are just getting started, um, oftentimes knowing how to define forest types, you know, like what are the size and stocking of trees, you know, um, things like that are often really hard to get at. Um, and so what we have is another essentially precursor to forest planner that we're working on uh, right now. And so you may see it by tree school next year um, called land mapper. Um, and, and that application is being designed essentially as the stepping stone before you would get to Forest Planner. So it's a much simpler application where the idea is that you could find your property, click on a tax lot instead of mapping it out individually, you just click on a tax lot and then it will auto generate your soil map, your topographic map, your aerial photo. Um, we're working uh, right now, we have a new grant that we just got. Um, from USDA and from NRCS, where we're trying to use aerial imagery and LIDAR, uh, LIDAR data to, to predict forest types um, so that we could actually give you a good guess of, it looks like this is a, a you know, large tree, Douglas fir, uh, fully, fully stocked, full canopy cover. You know, for example, or this is an alder maple stand. You know, that's uh, the small tree size class. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, in the poll, we'll have an option for you to say you'd like to learn more. Um, so definitely uh, chime in, uh, chime in if you have any more uh, questions or interested in learning uh, as we develop, continue to develop Forest Planner and other tools like Land Mapper. Um, so we have one question about how do you get the legend to show? Um, so if you're in the management scenarios um, or if you're uh, uh, in a place like this, the legend, um, uh, let's go to the scenarios. Uh, so when you're comparing maps side by side, the legend is hidden or unhidden uh, with these with these lines right here. Okay, um, we have one question: When a natural disaster um, destroys part of a stand, can we subdivide the existing stand? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, so what you would need to do, I'd probably uh, uh, start over. Um, if you want to do that, um, you have a couple options. You could edit the existing stand and um, move it to where it's smaller. 
Um, uh, depending on how complex the stand boundary is, that might be the easiest. The other option uh, is for you to delete the stand and just map two new stands and assign forest types to those two stands. Uh, thank you, Bruce, uh, uh, for the thumbs up. Um, I'm really happy to be able to share this with all of you. Um, if you have any more questions uh, that come up, um, you can uh, contact us. Um, uh, uh, you can also find help uh, on any single one of these pages, it will give you a little explanation here. Um, but uh, basically, if you want to contact me, um, you can just go to the EcoTrust website and you can find out our information. Um, and uh, look forward to hearing from more of you as you kind of dive in, uh, dive into your property. So with that, I think we have a final poll um, uh, to evaluate how much or how little you liked what we talked about today. Um, and I hope you'll please, please fill that out. Yeah, so I've got that poll up right now, um, and uh, it's open for folks to answer. As, as David mentioned, uh, Scott providing some feedback on this webinar, but also in there are a couple of extra questions um, specific to uh, the presentation that uh, David and Sarah gave today, asking if you are um, interested in more information, uh, and, and that would enable them to uh, reach back out to you. Um, while that, while folks are filling that out, I um, also wanted to mention real quick, just picked up on a thread that David had talked about earlier with respect to streams. Um, you know, he'd mentioned that that stream data layer uh, is maintained by ODF. And uh, we do have a, a project, a very, very long term, large scale project underway to try to improve that stream layer. Um, as you can imagine, that's a really big job. Um, but the the connection that I made in my head is just to remember that you can always reach out to your local stewardship forester. Uh, we have on the ODF website a find a forester tool, and that's a great way to uh, get some questions answered uh, that you might have about uh, any protected resources like streams on your property. And of course, if you're planning a uh, forest operation, you do need to file a notification that's free of charge uh, with the Department of Forestry as well. So wanted to mention that and then also um, if you don't mind bringing up that last slide there, um, David, um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like everybody has pulled that out. Um, just wanted to give a quick uh, reminder and advertisement for this afternoon's Tree School online class. Um, I'll be back again to host and uh, the guest this afternoon is, this afternoon is Christine Buell uh, with ODF. She's our forest entomologist and she's going to be talking about bugs in the trees. Uh, so that'll be at three o'clock this afternoon. And again, you can register for free at uh, knowyourforest.org. So that's... Uh, all the stuff I've got. David, did you have any final comments? I was going to say, I think we're, we'll hang around for another 10 minutes or so uh, to field any other questions that come up. Um, uh, so feel free to type them into the chat or, or add some more Q&A here. Um, like I said, really uh, excited to participate in this and want to give a, a big thanks to uh, Ryan and Carrie and Mike Clausey. Uh, for helping to pull uh, Tree School Online together. This has been a incredible undertaking. And I think we've all been learning a lot uh, dealing with uh, the pandemic and how to adapt. Um, and uh, each of these people has just made extraordinary contributions to make sure that we can keep doing uh, this type of work. So really wanna give thanks to them um, uh, for helping pull this together. Well, thank you both for, for joining us. And, and I should say there's a big team behind the scenes uh, to, to pull this off beyond just those, those folks you mentioned. Um, OSU Extension up in Clackamas County, uh, they usually put on tree school and uh, they're really the horsepower um, behind making this, this happen. It was, a, it was a big transition to go from the in-person context to, to online um, and just really pleased that we've been able to do it, so. So while we're hanging on, one of the things that I might add here is, um, uh, you know, I saw a question, um, uh, you know, about how to do collaboration, uh, you know, if you're working with other people. So I'd say the kind of, uh, there's a good example of that and uh, of ways that we've been seeing uh, uh, people use Forest Planner. Uh, the kind of extreme example 
um, is that we've had several high school and college instructors uh, set up forest planner accounts for a lot of their uh, students. And so this is an example where, you know, we have a, a high school on the Oregon coast where there is a community forest that the students have gone out to. They've been taught by the uh, 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 their science teacher how to collect forest measurements. And so they'll actually go out into the community forest, map out a forest stand, measure trees there. And then uh, they have a session as part of this lesson plan uh, where they actually go into forest planner and say, what happens if we manage our community forest this way or that way? So that's kind of an example example where if you want to do something like that, please reach out directly to us uh, to help you figure out, you know, how to work through some of the snags like that. Um, but it is possible. Um, and I will say it was one of the most exciting things to see uh, reports that were being submitted by high school students that had graphs and charts from Forest Planner copied and pasted into their assignments. Um, so there's some really cool stuff that you can do with this. You know, this is kind of a learning journey um, and hopefully uh, provides you a good tool to learn more about your forest and what you can do with it. Um, but I uh, uh, can't wait to kind of see the new ways that people uh, find to apply this. Um, so like I said, definitely feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we'd love to just hear, you know, uh, as you go through it, if anything's working or not working, um, just so that we can continue to improve the application uh, for you and other people like you over time. Well, it looks like, uh folks are starting to log out here and I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing um, any more questions popping up in the Q&A. Um, there's a looks like there's a comment over there in the chat box for you David. Yeah. But I think I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and um, oh, here we do have a question. A question, I'm not sure, um, this question asks if there will be links to plotting. Maybe that refers to the plot hound um, tool that you referenced early on, David. Yeah, I think Sarah I put think a, a link into the chat uh, with the link to that, to that uh, website earlier. Um, I definitely encourage you to chat, it, Ryan or, or uh, um, Carrie, I don't know if you all know whether there is a uh, inventory workshop that's being done with Tree School Online as well. Um, uh, but you could find that by going to uh, uh, these links um, that are shown on the slide here to see any other classes that are there. Um, uh, uh, Ryan, do you know if there's an inventory class that's being offered through Tree School Online this year? Well, I'm just. Uh pulling up the, the schedule here and I'm not immediately aware of one. I know that um, and maybe somebody will help me out with a text message or something in the background here in a minute. <laughs> um, I know there is some thought about trying to um, uh, so the answer I'm getting is, is no um, and I think the challenge is trying to figure out how to do that in this mm -hmm. online virtual format. <laughs> yeah, I know there's, right. you know, there's <laughs> been some discussion about trying to have um, some kind of field day ne perhaps next fall, but I don't think the plans for that are um, are solid just yet. Uh, with it just depends on the, um, yeah. I, she says exactly. So I'm getting, I'm, I'm being told that I'm saying the right thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this nothing beats Brenner, getting in the woods and wrapping a tape around team. trees. Yeah, for learning, um, it's kind of hard to beat. Exactly. Um, so uh, it looks like Carrie has pasted the link back down here. So this is a, um, a, a mobile application called Plot Hound that you can download. Um, it's by a company called Sylvia Terra. You may have seen some of the work they're doing to uh, build a map of the, all the trees in the United States. Um, but so they have this free uh, uh, application that you can use called Plot Hound, which you can take out in the woods with you to actually do inventory work. Um, and they have a companion uh, a website where you can uh, find your property, map it out, uh, um, and create a, uh, a cruise. Uh, or, or, or a sampling design where you can say, I, you know, at every point on this grid, you know, I want to go and uh, measure some trees. Um, so, so definitely check that out. Um, and uh, uh, we can probably post some links as well uh, on the resources page where we've kind of written a couple guides uh, about how to use that as well. Uh, so Sarah and I can follow up after after this to make sure those get posted on the on the uh, uh, Tree School website. 
Yeah, that'd be great if you would uh, forward those to Amanda. She'll she'll help get them posted up there. All right. Well, uh, I think we've uh, addressed most of the questions and things are pretty well wrapped up here. So I want to again thank you both for joining us and thank everybody who attended today. And uh, if you're available, we'll see you again this afternoon at 3 o'clock. So thank you all very much and uh, hope you enjoy this uh, beautiful sunny day.